very complicated. That's why we have such big brains. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Some of us do it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Before we get into today's topic, uh, don't forget to subscribe to Basically Related Podcast and leave a five-star review. You can also find us on YouTube as well and subscribe there. Remember to hit the notification bell so you'll know when we drop new content. Also, you can sign up for our monthly AMA episodes at basicallyrelated.com. Ask, a, ask us a question, basicallyrelated.com slash AMA. We answer all your questions in a monthly episode delivered to members only. So one thing I learned when uh, studying medieval history was that oftentimes we picture the medieval world sort of drab and dark. You know, we picture the castles the way the castles appear today, which is stone, bare stone, very dark, very cold. But what they would have looked like in the time that they were in use would be very, what we, what we would call gaudy. Mm. The walls would be plastered with all sorts of bright, vibrant colors, depictions of the life of Christ, uh, you know, hunting parties, you know, family lineages. Uh, it, it would have been vibrant everywhere. Anywhere they could put a painting, they put a painting to decorate the walls. And today, we we would be kind of uh, struck by that if we went into someone's home to see these, you know, bright colors hitting yeah. us in the eyes and and uh, all these depictions of of your family on the walls, but. For the medieval people, they enjoyed this partly because their life was imbued with symbolism. Mm -hmm. that, that, that everything was a, a sign for something else. You know, this is why um, many medieval churches are loaded with statues. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. there's, yeah. there's side altars everywhere, there's statues everywhere, there's art everywhere. And, and the whole idea was that it was supposed to raise your mind to God. Everything mm -hmm. in the church was to raise your mind to God, even the statues of the saints, that you would contemplate their lives, and that would inspire you yeah. mm -hmm. to greater attention at Mass. Um, and, but then there was kind of a shift in the modern world to kind of strip the churches and make them simple. Mm. And, and, and I think, you know, the best interpretation, I think, of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, and the, the years afterwards is people were trying to kind of go back to a, a simplicity of faith. You know, right. that the essentials that happen, the central thing that happens at, at church is mass mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the, the tabernacle and the Eucharist. And there's great truth to that, obviously, but it, it missed the idea that the, the statues, the art, the beauty wasn't a distraction. It was meant, again, to raise your mind. Yeah. But in, in, the, in an effort to, for simplicity, though, we kind of got everything minimal and flat. Yeah. And now you're kind of seeing that everywhere. You know, even the McDonald's and Coke mm -hmm. Locos and yep. Warner Brothers, everything. Um, and it's part of a, a greater debranding. Is, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, a a debranding effort. Yeah. Right. To make everything simple. Yeah. I remember uh, when I went to seminary, uh, my time in seminary was spent while uh, the Josephinum, the seminary I went to in Columbus, Ohio, their main chapel, uh, St. Terubius Chapel, uh, was uh, very drab and cold. <laughs> and I was lucky enough during my time where they actually restored it and brought uh, a sense of vibrancy and brilliance uh, back to the space. Mm. And on the far end, um, in the sanctuary, the big mural there, uh, when I first got there in 2014, it was uh, painted over just gray. <laughs> it was all gray. <clears throat> and... I remember I was talking to my friends about this um, uh, restoration uh, effort, um, you know, huge fundraising effort, um, so much conversation about this chapel. Uh, and the idea was, as, as you mentioned, that uh, it was painted over decades ago in an effort to uh, bring us, again, closer to the idea of uh, a simplicity of uh, prayer. Mm. No distractions, you know, let your mind just be attached to God uh, without all this, you know, all, all this art and imagery that could, again, distract. <clears throat> but the problem there was is that our minds aren't, they don't work like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need images to latch onto right. in order to uh, ascend. And so, you know, uh, on one hand, these old medieval cathedrals and uh, medieval architecture, it may seem on the surface chaotic, 
uh, gaudy, as you put it, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of images. But fundamentally, beneath the art, you have the architecture that's pointing you in one direction. When you look at you know, the spires of a medieval cathedral, it may seem uh, extremely intricate, but taken as a whole, it's symbolically pointing you up, right? Uh, you know, as Peter Kreeft once said, it looks like it's about to launch into space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's the point because it's directing your mind upwards and upwards is symbolically representative of God. You know, when you enter into the cathedral, there may be statues that are, you know, uh, in, in a sense, not symmetrical with each other. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, when you walk into St. Peter's Basilica, the pieta is on your right. That doesn't mean that there's going to be a pieta on your left <laughs> in, right. conform uh, in mm -hmm. conformity yeah. with uh, symmetry. However, all these things direct you in one place. Mm -hmm. And th the greatest example of this is, I think, in St. Peter's Basilica. I remember going in and was struck by all the different art, but at the same time, they were pointing you towards the sanctuary. And what I loved about it was that you had on the, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, on top of the um, columns, you had statues of Old Testament figures and angels. Mm -hmm. They were all different, but they were all actually pointing towards the sanctuary. It was mm -hmm. so beautiful, uh, with almost a sense of urgency. Like, there was mm -hmm. angels that were, like, leaning towards and looking forward mm -hmm. and literally pointing to the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And so, you have this art that's directing your mind. Um, and, that, and that's really indicative of, I think, the like modern, modern architecture in regards to churches is that it leaves too much up to the human imagination to ascend uh, right, right. <laughs> in contemplation uh, instead of actually aiding us. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as it relates to this sense of deep branding in a more general sense, um, even outside of um, the church, uh, I think it is a, a, a breakdown of symbolism, mm. a breakdown in, in meaning, mm -hmm. almost like you know modern art where you had you know cubism, um, you know abstract images, breaking down the beauty uh, into its essential elements. Right. Almost saying that like the the accidents of a artwork is all there is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that the the that the parts are just as great as the sum, right? Right. Um, Were you um that the church you're referring to in seminary? That's the the painting, the one with the angels, the multiple colors, angels. Yes, and Christ, the um, priest, yeah. is at the top. I remember visiting you in seminary and seeing that. Um, and I was I was in the middle of listening to Peterson's lecture, and I was listening to the one on Jacob's Ladder, where he's talking about psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> this thing is crazy!" Yeah. Um, and you were like, "Yeah, they, like they're that was painted over." I was like, "No way." Yeah. That's so crazy that like to think it's like that's like gray is better than this. Like, right. <laughs> what the heck? Right. And you can argue that. Um, no, you can't really argue that. No, I don't <laughs> think that there's a there's any uh, pro to that. Yeah. I think it was all kind but because the the image is uh, all these angels and then at the top is christ as priest right it's christ the high priest and yeah. what better image in seminary to have is when these seminarians are coming to worship at mass mm -hmm. to look at their ideal priest yeah and how is that i don't understand i just can't get into that mindset of like that's distracting yeah like why wouldn't you want to think about that yeah you there's know? a um there's a uh, podcast I listened to with Ian McGilchrist and Jordan Peterson, and he explained this in a like neuroscientist neuroscientific way about um, left brain versus right brain, and the example he gave between the difference between the left brain and the right brain was that um, a left brain, like the left brain, um, if you're a bird, so let's say, and you're looking at a pile of pebbles and you're looking for a seed, the left brain will say which one's a seed and which one is not. And like very um, action oriented and distinguishing this from not this mm -hmm. and just like black and white. The right brain is contextual. And so the right brain is focused on, should I be grabbing the seed now or is there a predator around? So the, mm -hmm. there's a huge difference um, in those two different activities, but they're still oriented towards one thing. And so there needs to be a communication between the two of them in order for like an act to happen. And I think that something like uh, 
the art that points to something higher is almost this kind of contextual element to the thing you're doing. So like, yes, it is about the Eucharist. It is about the mass, but the, the church you're in and the statues and the painting, they're all pointing to something that's almost like uh, obviously a spatial context, but then even a historical context, you see apostles and you see, you see people from different time periods. They're all pointing to this one thing. And that's the contextualizing Mm -hmm. of the thing you're doing. Yeah. And so that's where that communication between left brain and right brain tendency goes into even something like mass. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Yeah. The the church is supposed to be something, as you were saying, like set apart that is different. That if, if the church, putting it, putting the church in a correct context would be the figures you see here will be heavenly or a part of the apostolic tradition Mm -hmm. or things that raise your mind beyond those, this world. Yeah. But what's happened is now it's like you have church in a auditorium or, yeah, so, or right, you, right. Know, yeah. you right. know, obviously some churches have to have it in a, mm-hmm. uh, in their gym or something like that. But you, you do kind of get the sense though, that this building could be any other building yep. in some modern churches. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's missing the context right. of what they're supposed to be. Right. And, and ultimately the idea of beautiful churches and beautiful art and architecture um, that the medieval period exemplified is really in line with this uh, uh, the incarnation principle, right? That if God God became man so that we could focus our attention, <laughs> as it were, yeah. um, to God, um, so that we can you know be united with Him. You know, of course, it's uh, it's multifaceted, but that's mm-hmm. just one aspect of the incarnation. Is uh, you know, he, as uh, one of the church fathers said, He is an icon. Christ is an icon of the Father, mm. an image of the Father, uh, and so. If God can become man, if he can be an icon for us to imitate and to focus on, then shouldn't our entire world exemplify that principle? Right. Uh, yeah. Taking that so. incarnational principle like seriously. Yeah. And mm-hmm. being like all of creation is like this. It can act as symbol. And so like the church gathers things that it sees as pointing to the highest. Yeah, exactly. And so in in the wake of modernity, there was this sense of... There, there was this sense of stripping down meaning and, and detaching ourselves from tradition. Uh, you know, in, in the Vatican, uh, the Second Vatican Council, this idea to break away from these rigid ideologies uh, and just to be more free. And that's not only, again, that's not only exemplified in the church, but you see that in modern art too. Um, you know, that, that image of uh, that, that a French painter... Uh, who painted the the pipe and said this is not a pipe, mm-hmm. questioning what art is. Um, uh, again, all those uh, you know cubism and all, all those things that I mentioned earlier um, in modern art mm-hmm. is breaking away from tradition to to really epitomize our freedom and our own autonomy and will to right. to say what brings me meaning. Mm-hmm. And so in place of the church, you know, you got, you got American, at least I'm talking in, in, as an American in America, mm-hmm. uh, um, American idealism, where it's, it's um, my autonomy, my freedom. Um, I don't need institutions to tell me how to be happy. Right. I can find my own happiness. You look at modern liturgies. Uh, in the Catholic church, that was just kind of a free for all, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, over 30,000 ways to interpret the missile, uh, you know, and to say mass. Um, but now as we're entering into a postmodern age, not really as we're entering, we are now, I think, currently in a postmodern mm-hmm. age. We're now questioning the questioning because I think that that way of life just is not fulfilling and people are, are uh, realizing that. Right. And so now it's tradition. This tradition doesn't bring me happiness. That way of life doesn't bring me happiness. I can do what I want. But as people are doing what they want, they're also realizing that that's not bringing them happiness. And so, as we discussed in earlier episodes, um, you know, the Douglas Murray podcast that mm-hmm. we listened to, Douglas Murray said it plainly. Like, the fundamental question is, does anything mean anything? And that's, I think, now we're, you know, the issue of deep branding, everything's becoming very minimalized. It's like these icons of American idealism are even breaking down, <laughs> in a sense. Uh-huh. And so, yes, debranding is 
there's a utilitarian aspect to yeah. it. There's mm-hmm. the the idea that you know these logos have to be um, uh, minimal so that they can fit on your phone and they right. can look appealing mm-hmm. on your phone. You know, um, but I also think that it's symbolic of something else that's going on, and that you know the the uh, the icons again that we uphold like Coca Cola and McDonald's yeah. uh, that were symbols of American freedom mm-hmm. and autonomy. They're also breaking down as well. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean even like. The idea that a logo is becoming more minimal is just interesting because you have there like uh, something becoming more black and white than shades of gray, and like yeah. and even in that mm-hmm. you see the the symbolic language going on there of when we say like oh well it's shady or there's a gray area there it's like that's what we're talking about when we say that something has complexity, um, and so even in that things are becoming more uh, monolithic and like. Flat. And flat. Yeah. And then as opposed to understanding the complexity. And that is the left and right brain thing of like understanding the context, understanding the multiplicity and complexity of something. Uh, it seems like we're not able to do that. Like we're increasingly not able to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder if it's just we have, we, we just know so much in, in a way. Like, uh, or I should say, not that we know so much. We're aware yeah. of so much. Mm-hmm. Um. The, you know, you can find out news about anything, anywhere that's going on. And the world is becoming increasingly complicated, mm-hmm. or we at least know now. We're, we're, you know, we're involved in complications that actually have nothing to do with us. Yeah. But we still feel as though it's there. Yeah. And we're, we're seeing that the world is, as you said, multi-leveled and things, uh, you know, there's no party that's completely good or completely bad and uh foreign politics is difficult local politics is difficult and so we we were craving simplicity Mm -hmm. right like you said the more monolithic is like i i am so tired of hearing how complicated the world is just give me the answer for sure but on that side of like give me the answer i don't know if anybody has an anchor anymore Mm -hmm. yeah you know the the things that traditionally gave people anchors namely religion let's just say um, they don't have that to give them a worldview. Right. So instead, it's a, it's a shifting world, constantly shifting worldview to meet whatever is the socially acceptable virtue of the day. Yeah. Plus, I know what's happening from my local city, my neighborhood, to Russia. Yeah. 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 For sure. Like within the span of four years, you <laughs> had to become like an expert on like politics. And virology, <laughs> and then like yeah. foreign affairs. Like, right. what the heck? Like, am I supposed to have an opinion that's so in depth? Right. Just to have a normal conversation yeah. with somebody? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, that increasing complexity because of the information, because of the internet, um, and how like connected yet disconnected we are with social media, we're definitely craving that. Like, well, let's go to something more simple. Like, I need to simplify all this. And so, yeah. there is that kind of like we discussed before how like religion kind of stacks things in the right place. And it, and it, um, keeps things in a, the symbol, like symbolism doesn't necessarily simplify it, but it, it packs it together yeah. so that it's like, it, it's like, you know, if you have multiple pages on a desk, it kind of stacks them all on one, Unifies one it. thing. Yeah. It's a unifying principle. So without that, then you're, then what's to stop society from being like, we need to simplify things and then turn to like racism or bigotry or bias. You know, like yeah. they're going to turn to things that just kind of cut things off yeah. haphazardly without a contextual, like, well, what is the dignity of a human person? Like, are white people okay? Like, you yeah. know, like that, mm-hmm. get, that gets really messy if you don't have a, an underlying anchor. And it's so, I think that's the attraction of, you know, you have Biden saying like, oh, you know, all Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Yeah. And then you have Trump saying like, the Democrats are out to mm-hmm. destroy your way of life. Mm-hmm. It's, and, and people love that because it brings simplicity to their worldview. Yeah. If right. you can just think black and white, you don't really need to think at mm-hmm. all, essentially. Right. So, yeah. Right, and that's um, I think that's sort of the, the allure of of ideology. Sometimes is it presents a, a fully or a complete package mm-hmm. of worldview, right. but the dark underbelly of that is that they are half truths, right? Most of the time, mm-hmm. but they give you this neatly packaged worldview that mm-hmm. you might be able to latch onto yep. that give that helps you with the complexity of life, yeah, and the problems of life. Right. Um, like I said, in it, but it ends up being more monolithic in thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And and I I, I think in regards to 
giving you a black and white worldview. It's very clear that people, I think subconsciously, they're not satisfied with that, which is why they have to go overseas and care about wars that are not even happening on their own shores and, and think like, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and say, Father, like I, I'm, I'm concerned about um, the war in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Or, and I'm like, focus on your life. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, you know, you can't do anything really right. um, in regards to overseas mm-hmm. affairs. But what you can do is focus on your own worldview, focus on your own family, you know. Um, so I think with that black and white um, world, with the, with the black and white worldview comes a, um, uh, an existential crisis because it's not enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, our minds are made to think and grasp yeah. truth. And when it's not enough, you're going to try and push your troubles fa- uh, as far away from you as possible, which is why we're caring about foreign affairs when we can't even take care of our own households, in a sense. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the connection between kind of that l- lack of right brain activity of like contextualizing things uh, and then the left brain really kind of dominating is kind of Ian McGilchrist's whole like his whole thing is that like he's trying to show how this kind of progresses worse and worse and we're losing meaning um, wait so just for clarification yeah. right brain is considered art the contextual and, complexity okay yeah and, and that's intuitive. Um, that's like the artist's brain whereas like the left is scientific yeah, you Is could that, say that. Okay, yep. okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, that's how mm-hmm. I understand yeah. it. Yeah, okay. for sure. Gen- like, broadly speaking. Yeah, broadly mm-hmm. speaking, yeah. Um, so as we're losing that kind of poetic, artistic, contextual mind, we lean more towards uh, ideology in order to, you know, keep ourselves from experiencing something that's too complex, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting because it seems like the having to reconcile with something that's complicated is inevitable, like you were saying. Um, and if you're not familiar with doing that, then you increase in your ideology, right? Like you're trying to get farther and farther away from it. And so you're getting like narrower and narrower. Um, and so doing things like understanding complexity are helpful in even small ways to start to enlarge in your worldview, which is like, you know, why, you know, people are encouraged to do hard things or like, uh, you know, whatever, learn a new skill so that you understand that there's complexity and then you build from there into higher and higher levels of thinking that allow you to deal with complexity on a bigger scale. Mm-hmm. So like losing something like religion, losing something like beautiful art is like really removing those like easy stepping stones of learning how to deal with a complicated issue like foreign policy. If you, you know, tend to like need to think about that for whatever reason. Like obviously there's leaders who need to know these things. So not everybody can just tend to their family, although that's for the most part, very useful information. But for the, for the people who have to make these decisions, they have to deal with this complexity and that's going to, you know, drip down to the culture. Uh, It's definitely both useful and necessary to have those stepping stones of complexity within your life Mm -hmm. to get to that point. Yeah. Um, Lee, you have a bunch of notes here yeah, about left and right brain stuff and how Jung talks about it. Do you want to go through some of that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so as, as we said, the the right brain is typically associated with uh, intuition, creativity, imagery, symbolic thought, um, or play, humor, compassion. Mm. Um, and in a book, The Development of the Unconscious Mind by Alan Shore, he says that his one of his main thesis of uh, of the book is that uh, the right brain is the psychobiological substratum for the unconscious mm. that Freud talks about. I mean, he says Freud, um, but I also probably argue Jung. Um, now, Jung obviously didn't have too complicated of understanding of, of the brain for his time, but uh, he he said that. Both Freud and Jung thought that the unconscious was prior to consciousness, that a child was essentially unconscious until much later in maturity and in age, Mm. and consciousness came later. Uh, And Alan Shore seems to actually support this theory, that 
for for the most part, a child is uh, functions in a largely unconscious way in an unconscious activity. And one way that their unconscious mind is shaped is actually through what he calls face-to-face proto-conversations, particularly with mothers. Mm. He said that you know fathers play a role obviously in brain development, but it seems like it's not that's not until maybe around the second year. But in the in the first few months in the first year, um, in this these face-to-face conversations, the right hemisphere of the mother and the right hemisphere of the child are actually engaging in. The, the same areas of the brain are roughly the same areas of the brain are, are activated mm. in, in a rhythmic fashion. And the child learns to pick up these non-conscious cues. So uh, non-verbal facial recognition, mm-hmm. um, tone, um, his motherese, I think he says, yeah. you know, the way that the way a mother talks to a child. Mm-hmm. And he says this impacts them for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rest of the child's life is, is this first, first experience of the mother. And Jung says that the, the one of the most, primordial and immediate archetypes is the mother Mm. that it's the first person you really experience you know even in utero and he says that from there though um in this unconscious state the child develops uh the archetype of the mother Mm. that the mother is not experienced as mother or as you know this particular mother but as the archetypal mother Mm. and from there he also says that this impacts the child for the rest of their lives. Mm. And so I, I thought it was very interesting that this, this right brain activity um, seems so powerful and so, um, but yet so unaware. We're so unaware of it. Right. And I, I, I don't know, I don't know what to make of the like lack or the, the kind of, yeah, the lack of symbolic thought or the lack of intuition I don't know if it's like, you know, are, are children getting less face-to-face time as infants with their mothers yeah. or um, is it an undervaluation of the unconscious? I, right. I, 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 I don't necessarily know. As as with most symbolic things, it's probably a mix of all the things. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting um, and how that works out on the, the child level because then you really do have this like union between infant and mother that's inseparable and the child really kind of identifies with the mother and not like this other thing Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. and then classifies it because the same way you would think like oh like the hero archetype like you kind of like identify that within yourself Mm -hmm. as not like this other thing but within you like that's how the infant and the mother interact and this like it's part of me and then the father obviously as that archetypal figure like brings them out into chaos um And then starts to show them the world of like opposites, the world of like black and white of distinctions and, and that kind of scientific thinking, which is interesting because if, if you, if you take all of the steps from infancy to, you know, young childhood into adulthood, but you lost all those aspects of mother prior and all you just had was just the left brain science black and white, then you lose any of those intuitions. Yeah. You lose the, uh, the feminine, um, all of the archetype that comes with the feminine, um, the, the empathy, the creativity, the symbolic thought, um, insight, all of that gets lost. And I mean, not surprisingly, you're, you have a culture that's just stuck in a, like a meaning crisis. Hmm. Yeah, I think that if you lose, if you really do s- separate yourself from your mother, um, entirely, you it, it becomes problematic, and and that's I think what we see culturally is a world that is hyper left brain, mm-hmm. hyper uh, uh, material, mm-hmm. but you know there's there's that balancing act that I think that we have to do is that yes you you know we are called to separate ourselves from home. You know, uh, go out with your father and hunt and leave your mother behind. Yeah. You know, become a man. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But at the same time, not severing yourself off completely. Right. And I think it's the archetype, the archetype of rescuing your father from the underworld. But maybe like in relation to your mother, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is interesting. Um, You know, this is just me intuiting here. But separating yourself from your mother, but still taking behind the value of... Right. What you learned, right? 
Um, Even it says that in the scriptures, like a man was, must leave his mm-hmm. mother and father, yeah. but then what? Cling to his wife. Uh, yeah, you know exactly. So you're still, there's still an element of reconciling right. the feminine. Yeah, you're not leaving behind the feminine, mm-hmm. right? So you are, in a sense, leaving behind your particular mother, mm-hmm. but you're not leaving behind um, what made you who you are in that moment. So, yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah, that is, I mean, Ian McGillicris talks about how, so like the left brain is either or, and the right brain is both and. Mm-hmm. And he says a lot of people think it's either or or both and, but it's either or and both and. Mm, yeah. Like that distinction yeah. is important of like it's a communication between the two. Like it, it, it is um, what is a seed and what is a rock and am I being chased by a predator? Mm-hmm. So you have to have both or else like if you're just like am I being chased like a predator, you're just stuck in fear all the time and worrying about that but never pick up a seed. Yeah. And if you just pick up a seed haphav- haphazardly, then you might get swept up by a predator. Yeah. So it's like, it obviously is a constant communication between the two. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That, that's, that's interesting. Cause uh, Jung talks about in the same talking about, you know, the development of the unconscious with, with children and their mothers that, you know, people, and I don't think he's, he doesn't specifically say Freud, but he's thinking of Freud um, when he says that later, people think that the mother is substituted for a Holy Mother Church, let's mm. say. You know, that you find substitutions for your biolo- for the loss of your biological mother mm. in other places. And Freud says, or I'm sorry, Jung says that's not true. Their Holy Mother Church and your mother are, inter- are intertwined in another reality. They're the, yeah. the, the same thing. So it's not yep. <laughs> kind of like you're like either or. It's, well, she is your mother. Yep. And so is Holy Mother Church. Yep. It's not, it's not, it's, it's mm-hmm. both and and either yep, yep. or all, yeah, yeah, all They're that. not the same thing yeah. and they're not distinct, but they're but, pointing to something else. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, so it's like, you know, you're, but your first, that primal relationship with your mother helps you to see that. Yes. And yep. that even, you know, you talk about clinging to your wife. He says it's, it, it shouldn't be surprising to us that, you know, men marry women who are like their mothers or, mm-hmm. and women yeah. Yeah, like their fathers. Sure. Um, because because of these primordial relationships, mm-hmm. that there's a reality of which your mother teaches you how to be. How, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right in, in that first relationship. Yep. Um, she teaches you this complexity of thought, actually. Right. Um, yeah, that that's really interesting. that you know later your father, did you said teaches you kind of the rules and the authority and the boundaries. Yep. Yeah. Um, on on the um, on the note of complexity of thought, I want to like tell you guys a story that I was thinking about last week. Um, all right. So my second oldest is starting school and his attention span, like just, just shooting straight here is not good. <laughs> uh, he like, he's very, uh, not like hyperactive distraction, but just like, you know, wandering that like hyper, not like the, like, um, hyper focused on one thing at a, like a million things at once. It's like on nothing. You know, it was like that kind of just like days. Um, so I've been like trying to really break down. I mean, the last couple of years, he's six now, but the last year or so, I've been trying to break down his goals into smaller, like, you know, okay, I know you can't put on your shirt now because you're getting distracted. Can you just like put on, just put on the top on your head and then come to me with your shirt half on? Yeah. Like that helps. Um, Peterson had... I've been listening to a lot of Peterson podcasts. If you haven't noticed, um, <laughs> he had a uh, Andrew Huberman. Uh, Huberman, Andrew mm-hmm. Huberman. Um, he's also a neuroscientist, and he's like super big on like just on like really unpacking the um, like chemical stuff that's going on in your brain. Super interesting stuff. Uh, but he was talking about how when you set a goal and you reach it, you have what's called a dopaminergic cycle that gets completed, right? And so like you have a goal. You reach it, you get the reward. You get a little dopamine mm-hmm. kick. Um, and then what that does is that right when you complete that cycle, you your brain has like a heightened state of neuroplasticity, which means that your brain can make new pathways. Mm. So it's almost like you're, what, it's not almost, it is your brain being able to make new pathways and telling yourself what you can do. And it makes it easier the next time to do that thing. Mm. Right? So it's like, I need to go... Well, so he was saying that if you want to reach a goal and it seems too heavy, 
you can break it up into smaller portions mm -hmm. so that you get that kind of dopaminergic cycle more frequently. And then on in the in the hole, you complete that whole cycle. So it's like working out. Not only are your muscles um, being trained to lift more, but your brain is actually... Yes. You, like you work out today, so your goal is met. Right. And then there's room in your mind to grow even further. Correct. Okay, but even in the like, I need to start working out. It's like, well, make a checklist. Mm -hmm. Like I need to get up. I need to put my shoes on. I need to eat breakfast. Yeah. I need to pack my gym clothes. I need to drive to the gym. Like, and if, like, if you have a checklist and you're checking those off, you're actually completing smaller dopaminergic cycles Interesting. and telling yourself that you can do things mm -hmm. in general. And then you have more neuroplasticity to do more things. Mm. Um, so I was like, I love that. That sounds great. <laughs> I really need to integrate this with my kid. Um, mm -hmm. And so because of that, just thinking about his attention span, thinking about how to integrate that, I've just been getting a little worried about him starting school. Being like, he's not going to be able to last the length of a school lesson um, because they're long and, you know, you know, school is not exciting sometimes. Yeah. But in talking to my wife about this, she's like, yeah, well, that, I mean, you know this. She reminded me that like the Charlotte Mason method actually has in its system the idea of shortened lessons. So like a math lesson is no longer than 10 minutes because of this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's not a sign. It's not um, because of a, like, it's not like Charlotte Mason under, understood the dopaminergic cycle. Mm -hmm. She knows the development of children and understanding that this is how you build habits and this is how you build patterns and whatever. Um, and so I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like, well, we got it in the system, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a worrier. So like, I was like, yeah. yes, let's go. Um, but it was interesting to think about how, um, in terms, like how, tying this all back to this left brain and right thing, right brain thing, it's interesting to think how coming across something that is uh, that came from neuroscience, mm -hmm. the dopamine cycle, and then something that came from uh, child education is is pointing to something that's more fundamental than themselves, right? And so, like for me, that's an awesome aha moment. Like, wow, this is amazing. But to somebody who is like heavy left brain, to hear something from neuroscience and think that that has nothing to do with like development of virtue or a, like a religious aspect of grace and giving you an opportunity to move forward in life like that all fits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you're heavy left brain you're gonna think that that's in conflict it's like oh no it can't just it can't be a dopaminergic cycle because that conflicts what i think about grace or that conflicts <laughs> about what i think about virtue yeah like what about philosophy and whatever like it's all the same and it takes a contextual right brain leaning to understand that those are all fitting. And like you were saying about the, the mother versus mother church, they're actually pointing to something higher, yeah. which is like truth itself. That, that's where you get into transcendental truth and what have you. Um, and I, again, like we're even within smaller, smaller groups are losing the ability to see that kind of multivariate truth showing up in different fields and being like, this is all one thing. Yeah. This is like all like it's it's symbolic life in that like they're all pointing to other things which are pointing to something higher. Right. Right. I think yeah, people I think people who are uh anti-religious uh, on the surface, <laughs> you know, as we said before, you can't really be uh non-religious, yeah. but anyway. <laughs> um that's a whole other can of worms. Um but people who I think are out to um out to out Christianity. Yeah. would look at something like um uh, like neuroplasticity yeah. and like mm -hmm. that whole thing, mm -hmm. and say, "Aha! You see, uh, you you know Aristotle's um, way to be virtuous, or right, you right. know uh, a religious way mm -hmm. um, of of thinking. It's just it's just psychology. It's right. just. But in my mind, actually, that lends validity to Christianity. Yes, because the whole idea of Christianity is that we're we're like our soul, body, mind. They're not distinct from each other and not in communication with each other. They're actually one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and if we are one unified being, you know, we're, we're persons that are not, um, that don't have divisions in our, in our different aspects of our being, then if there's going to be one area uh, that we can prove, you know, or, or talk about in validity, it's going to align with the other areas. Mm -hmm. And so, I think an idea, like the idea that, um, like, your whole um, 
point about neuroplasticity uh, being uh, invalidating religious thought or being in conflict with uh, right. other modes of knowing. In my mind, that, that's a dualistic way yeah. to understand the human person. It's also, I mean, like it is the case, like that is a really frequent argument that atheists will bring up or like scientists or scientific atheists per se of being like, it's not that it's just a dopaminergic cycle, yeah, yeah. Or whatever like that. It's just this and they explain it to you in a science way. It's like, well, you're not, you don't understand how this actually fits. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And that's like yeah. people looking at the gospels and saying, well, there are myths that, that, you know, that have come before Christianity that mimic the Christian story, mm-hmm. like a hero being born of a virgin or a yeah. hero being uh, born in December, you know, the winter mm-hmm. solstice or, you know, all these like similarities. They're like, ha, aha, like that invalidates Christianity. It's like, no, why can't it be both end? You right. know, or why can't that point to the Christian story as right. a fulfilling, you know? Yep. Um, and yeah. I, I think in my mind that that's just, again, a, a dualistic way of understanding um, nature. Um, mm. But Maybe maybe there's more nuance there that I'm not catching, but I'm convinced. Yeah. So. I mean, you also have <laughs> you also have on the other hand too. Like, you don't want to lean into like every religion is the same religion. It's all pointing to something higher. Like there is yeah. there are there, distinctions. There, there are it yeah. it is either or and both and yeah. That's mm-hmm. the yeah. thing. Like it's a communication between the two things. Yeah. 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 Very complicated. That's why we have such big brains. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Some of us do it. <laughs> Um, anything else you guys want to bring up in these notes? You know, I, I, I'm still, I'm still very, I'm, I'm just curious about the, the right brain and left brain, uh, left brain, like dominance, I guess. Is, mm. Did Ian McGilchrist say if that, is that like a, uh, a verifiable thing that they've ever, it's like that people are yeah, I becoming think more? Progressively more Progr- left like, yeah. brain dominant. Yeah. That's yeah. how, how mm. he would say that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because I, I didn't know if that's just like kind of in appearance or, yeah. you know, because I know. Yeah, he has a book called The Matter with Things, which is what they discuss. Okay. Uh, it's like 1,500 pages. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he sets out to prove it. <laughs> yeah. I, well, because I, I just didn't know, like, you know, Jung and this, you know, Alan Shore both kind of acknowledge that in, in younger years, it seems like the right brain slash unconscious is the bit, you know, plays a big role. And then mm-hmm. later it's, it's, uh, it's replaced by consciousness, and but that's mm. a sort of the the natural development of things. And I didn't know if it's more just the natural development of things, and seemingly mm-hmm. we're more left brained, or if there's actually yeah, like, data. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like if right. if it actually we are yeah more left brain, right, right. but it appears yeah we are we are interesting that yeah. I, it, like I said, and so now I'm interested in the cause, like what what exactly is bringing that mm-hmm. about? I, you know, right. I, I don't know. Um, you know, cause yeah, because it's uh, we, we talked a little bit before about uh, Jonathan hates uh, coddling. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's like so children are getting more mommy time, at least but, mothered. But, yeah, yeah not but the right one. well, exactly. And then it's mm-hmm. like, well, is it the same? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. you know, is, is helicopter parenting the same mm-hmm. as a worthy that, substitute as real parenting? R- right. Yeah. Um, because technically, right. that mothering comes from like the feminine or the mother herself, or even the father, um, not reconciling with the complexity of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like if you give somebody who's a mother per se, heavy, a heavy left-brained mother, then mothering her child is not exactly going to give them the right brain development. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. You know. So yeah. it's, right. it's like. Right. Culturally and family, like a society, as things go more towards science and, you know, whatever. Like so, it, it's yeah. just. So I, I thought, yeah, on one hand of the, the, the fact that it seems like society prizes more left brain mm-hmm. distinction, rationality. Uh, I also thought of um, Hate's idea of safetyism, the cult mm-hmm. of safetyism he talks about. Mm-hmm. So because that's that's the other aspect is that. The, the left brain is explored territory. It's, you know, things that you know. Yep. And the right brain's threat, punishment, unknown, mm-hmm. unexplored territory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if we are trying to minimize unknown things, you know, safe spaces, right, right. minimize threats, mm-hmm. whatever those might be, real or imagined, right. 
is is that causing less right brain activity? Yeah, I think mm. I think it has something to do with like again the inevitability of complexity. Like it's going to happen, and the fact that we've lo- we're losing it means that we're unfamiliar with how to use it. Right. And so it's like you know we get to college and we had no like kind of right brain development, even religious, you know, like, again, like we've lost the symbol in churches and, and the way we worship and the way we pray, like all of these things culturally are like right brain deficient. Then we get into college where the inevitable complexity of other people's opinions show up and you're like, whoa, how do I deal with complexity? And you're forced to use your right brain. Like, no, no, no more ideology. Well, like our modern education system is heavily left brain anyway. Um, you know, it's uh, all yep. about STEM, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, how do I use my mm-hmm. degree? Mm-hmm. And so I think like the cultural movement is, can be characterized as left brain dominant. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I think, I, I don't know how that bleeds into um, like evolution and how people are born more mm. right versus left brain. But it seems to me that that would lend itself to just bring up a culture that is in general left brain dominant. Yeah. So. Yeah, the reason why it's interesting, at least to me, is that it maps on to everything we've talking about, about this like flight from women, mm-hmm. this like lack of femininity, intuition, yeah. and this like hyper science. Um, it's just, it's all the same. So it's like, which one caused what? Like, is it brain scans that are like showing that right. left brain activity is increasing or whatever? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the history on that one, but it's definitely, it's all in parallel as a sign that it's occurring. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it could be... <laughs> Like we said before, all of these, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's maybe the mothering aspect. Maybe it's the rise of safetyism. Uh, maybe it's even independent play. You know, right. Like, you yeah. know, children mm-hmm. just don't engage in symbolic play. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Or, or you know, the play that they do is video games. And it's not to mm-hmm. knock video games. I love video games. <laughs> but it's more of the the world is sort of given to you. Yep. I guess in, in, yeah, in video games, yeah. you know, whereas yep. if there's five children playing together, they have to create the game. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, Verveke talks about that and yeah. then the rise of video games being like a, a world in which there are no real repercussions. And so you don't quite learn anything. Right. Like the dopaminergic cycle completes, uh, but you don't actually learn from being in that world. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't translate as well. Well, and the idea of being brought up in a culture that is where you're a child and you, like you said, your play is less creative and it's more technological. Mm-hmm. Um, you're participating in someone else's creativity, mm. but you're not actually creating. Right. <laughs> um, right. And so it's a passive creativity yeah. in, in a sense. Right. And that, that I think that could also be defined as left brain. You know, mm-hmm. um, It's a technological play. So. Yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking of the ways in which the right brain isn't stimulated for growth yeah. in, mm-hmm. you know, in these various things. And maybe that's one of them. Like yeah. You're yeah, yeah, participating in yeah. someone else's yeah. creativity. It's you, like go outside, play with a stick. Like the stick is a sword. It's a, yeah. right. it's, or it's, draw a picture. Yeah. Right? Whatever. Um, yeah. It's yeah. like you get all these things, like even like going outside and playing with sticks, it's like you're only left with what could only potentially be symbolic <laughs> things yeah, to yeah. play right. with. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you're learning how to see things yeah. in things that are beyond your senses. Right. Like, very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's stop there. Um, it is basically related.com, uh, to sign up for our AMAs, uh, and ask a question. I am Matt Hylam on all social media and Lee is coach lead. We'll see y'all later.